the Honorable Minister for Information and MP for Opasi Ayerbe, Kojo Opongrum. I'd like to speak to you all the time. You're welcome to come <laughs> Thank you for having me, Sandra. You know why i like to talk to you? Because I used to listen to your radio, then you became, and maybe I mean to have become minister. Well. Just that you were doing morning, I'm doing evening. So I'm well, not sure whether it will work. You never know. Maybe I should switch to... You never know. I should join Bernard on the breakfast. You show. never know. How are you doing, though? I'm well. Yourself? I'm well. How is your I'm, ministry? We're good. How's your family doing? Family is blessed. How is your family doing? We're good. We're good. How is the economy doing? The economy is, uh, I think, uh, dead, dead. gradually um, recovering from some of the major challenges we've had. I'm sure you saw the um, latest inflation numbers, mm -hmm. though still very high. Uh, we're beginning to see um, a certain dip. Uh, would like to believe that we've gone past the peak. Um, the composite index of economic activity from the Bank of Ghana suggests that there's an uptick in um, economic activity gradually uh, going up. Um, we still have major challenges with, um, I say, liquidity. Um, and we're still in the process of concluding um, our, our IMF transaction. So we've seen very terrible days. Uh, but I think if you look at the dashboard, gradually it appears we are beginning to turn the curve. The way Everybody keeps talking about the IMF. It's almost like that's the final solution to all our problems. Is it really? No, it's not. And I think it's a very important question you've asked. If you go back to the statement issued under my hand on the 1st of July 2022, I think we mentioned that the government of Ghana has an enhanced domestic program, which had been designed to help us recover from the major shocks that we were suffering. And that to make that program effectual, we will need, well, we didn't talk about all the support mechanisms we need, but we mentioned that we will need at least some balance of payment support from the IMF. And that is what we have been working on. And all indications suggest to us that we should be bringing that to a closure pretty soon. But that will only be balance of payment support from the IMF. I think 1.4 billion in the first year, 800, 800 in the next two years. But that is not the panacea to all our, uh, may I say, economic challenges. We have um, a seven-part program known as the Post-Crisis Program for Economic Growth, PCPEG, um, which has this balance of payment part as one of the pillars. But the other pillars within it are supposed to help us ensure that, among other things, we're able to bring back growth uh, and jobs and get the private sector really kicking and get the cost of living under control. The IMF program itself, uh, when you announced it, there <coughs> were a lot of um, issues that came up, but there was still a lot of confidence on your side as government that yeah. you're going to clinch the deal. Yeah. It appears the deal is fleeting, isn't it? So let's look at the timelines. In July, we said we were commencing engagements and that we were hoping to um, complete a staff-level agreement before the end of the year. I think we were successful in doing that. The data or the dates will show clearly that we managed to get a staff level agreement before the end of the year. And then we said that we wanted to get to the board by the end of quarter one, which was um, the end of March, um, quite an ambitious target. We have come very far. One of the things we needed as a prior action was to get the financing assurances from the Paris Club and then most likely um, China. We've come very far. Um, in April, when we were in Washington, to literally conclude the conversations. We got every indication that uh, those financing assurances will be coming through and then we'll get to the board. So right now, we are just waiting uh, to be taken to the board to get board approval. Uh, so March, uh, yes, we've missed by one month. Um, that's April. Now we are in May and we keep our fingers crossed that we will be getting um, to the board uh, as quickly as possible. The indications we get from within the, the, the corridors of power at the fund suggest that um, we should be getting there soon. And would that soon mean by end of May or by next month? Well, I'm not going to put timelines to it. Um, I think we have done our part of it. We have uh, fulfilled all right choices. Have you? Because the, the domestic debt restructuring, the external debt, you haven't done that. So you haven't really finished your homework, have Well, you? the homework, the prior actions included the domestic. It didn't include the external. Mm. So the domestic, we have concluded that. Um, we have concluded the passage of the revenue measures and then the other prior actions, the zero 
uh, percent financing with the central bank. We've done all of those. Okay. So that's why I said we fulfilled all right. You, now in the hands of the you mentioned the Paris Club, and now my last <clears> question <throat> on the economy. Um, you have boosted to us that... Boosted? I mean government, <laughs> not you, but you, are, you speak for the government. You boosted to us that we are a proud nation and all of that, blah, blah, blah. Now you are begging, begging Japan and the others to help you at the Paris Club. Uh, what's happening? Well, we, we as no part of, of as, well, I'm not going to go into those conversations. As mm. part of um, the prior actions, we need financing assurances. We have reason to believe that having completed the, um, the things that we were supposed to do, those uh, financing assurances um, should be coming before the IMF board. And once we get the approval, we can close the chapter on the balance of payment support side and then now deal with all of the other matters that require um, all of us to participate. This is Point Blank on Eyewitness News. My guest is the Minister for Information, Kojo Ponkrumah. Let's talk about the RTR now. It is, <coughs> the Secretariat is at your ministry? Well, no. You know, a lot of people, and when I interact with people, I get the impression that a lot of people really haven't followed um, the uh, legal architecture for the right to information. First of all, it's not the RTI Act that gives the right to information. Okay. The right to information is a constitutional right in Article 211F of the Constitution. The challenge was that there was no procedural act that spells out how to go uh, about accessing that act. So for about 17 years, close to two decades, like you mentioned, uh, from 1999 onwards, we were battling as a country how to enact that procedural act. So Act 989, which was um, passed on the 26th of March in 2019, it's only a procedural act. It spells out how to apply for information, what the timelines are, who to apply to, and if you are not happy, what to do um, about it. Now, as part of the roadmap to implementation, we set up an RTI secretariat uh, at the Ministry of Information for those first six months to prepare the grounds, to lay the groundwork. It did its work successfully. And then later, we converted it into what you call the Access to Information Division of the Information Service Department. Now, that's the supply side of RTI. Because when you go to a public institution to apply for information, you are demanding it. So you constitute the demand side. Uh, civil society groups, media houses, individuals, academia, we constitute the demand side. The supply side is provided by the ISD, by the Access to Information Division of the ISD. Then you have the RTI Commission, that is the regulator, to ensure that the supply side needs are being complied with. Uh, and then all the other requirements of the act are being followed. So this is the architecture that we work with. And then on top of it is the ministry, uh, which is coordinating the activities between uh, these various organs. Now, to date, we are happy to update the public that we've succeeded in uh, rolling out about um, 478 um, information units, properly so-called. Okay, I'm coming kind of, up. Before, I, uh, the, so the commission is the super, regulator. The regulator. Yes is in existence. It is in existence. They've got a staff of 120, a board of seven. They have dealt so far with over 100, um, call them petitions or applications that people were not happy about when they applied to the institutions and okay. they've come for resolution. They so that's like to... the NCA of the Absolutely. information space. Absolutely. If I ask, say, G, G, not GNA, give me any public institution, I say, give me information, they don't give it to me. Yes. I'll go to the commission and say, I asked for this, they refuse to give me, or they charge me so much or and so less. And then the commission will hear the okay. um, petition or the application for review okay. and make the necessary orders. Where, where is their physical presence? Are they Jowlu. At... They, are, okay. they, are, they, are, they are in Jowlu here um, in Accra. So far, the commission has dealt with about 101 uh, applications for review. They have um, imposed penalties of, of over 1.3 million Ghana cities on various public institutions and okay. public officers who are not complying um, and are doing a pretty, pretty, pretty good job uh, in regulating how, in particular, the supply side um, works. And so far, uh, from the supply side, we have uh, recruited, trained, deployed over 320 information officers across public institutions who are serving the general public. So this is government. This is, yes. This you is have government. decided to put people in ministries, departments, and agencies yes. who are like the RTI offices there. Absolutely. So anyone who needs information would That's deal with it. That's where you go. Is that part of the law or this is just it is, you? It is. This is in accordance with Section 3 of the RTI Act, which requires us to have information units, etc. So what we've done is to um, put the ATI division of the ISD uh, in effect, and they provide the officers who are there. So each ministry now would have, or each 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 public office would have that, but it's under the 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 people at your ministry. 
the information services department. To go there and, then and these are support. ISD offices, yes, yes, so are, they supply are, that information. Are, but I must be quick to mention that not all public offices um, have people from our place who are supporting them. Yeah. Um, I mean, you know, like we started talking about, we've got an economic challenge, budget constraint, so you can't uh, put, you know, all of the people that you want there at the same time. Though we find that in places where ISD offices have been posted, the compliance with the law is way, 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 way okay. higher than in other places where Sander is working as a journalist and he's also been designated that if somebody brings RTI request... You deal with it. Yeah, you deal with it. But do you, do you have like a percentage that has been covered so far? Um, where you have agents or officers? Yes, currently, out of the 478, we've done about 320, um, you know, officers who are in these institutions and counting. And we continue to work to populate some more. I remember when you, the, the law was passed, you said you needed some time to yeah, get it run. six months. First six months. Yeah. So is it fair now to say that everything is going smoothly as planned, RTI? Well, even, you know, uh, aircrafts that are flying smoothly sometimes have turbulence. So uh, to say everything is moving smoothly will not be, um, you know, very fair to ourselves. But if I can just give you some data. Yes, please. So far, we have received 1,053 information requests. 1,053. And we have granted 838 of them. That's about 80% of all the requests that have come through have been responded to. The other 20% are in different categories. Some have been um, rejected based on the law. If you look between sections 5 and 16, there are bases on which you can deny information. Um, there are those who have been um, deferred or transferred to other institutions or um, to another time based on what um, the law um, says. It gives you a fair sense of how uh, the act is being complied with across the various uh, public institutions. Um, we continue, as I mentioned, to embark on some public education to help the demand side because once people know about the law and how it works, then they are better able to, you know, uh, apply the law uh, in their search for information. And I think that gives a fair sense of how we are doing in implementing this law. So typically, the kind of people who come to ask for information, are they journalists or there could be a good number? In fact, I, I mean, I think that the majority of requests have come from, um, I mean, if you were grouping them, you would say journalists. Journalism. Then you have civil society groups. Uh, then you have a bit of um, academia and then um, individuals also coming through. For, but there's some information, information that you can refuse to give absolutely, and the law supports absolutely, you. Absolutely, absolutely. What kind of information could that be? Between sections 5 and 16 spell out various categories, if I just may highlight um, a few. So, for example, information that is um, used for internal decision-making, internal uh, procedures and decision-making, you are allowed um, not to make that information available. And the framers of the law did that because the thinking is that if you do that, you would gradually inhibit people, uh, people's ability to freely express themselves during decision-making processes uh, because then they're afraid that some sometime down the line somebody will pick it up and use it um, against them. Information, for example, that borders on some security um, you know, measures may be withheld on security grounds. It doesn't mean that security institutions are exempt from the act. That was one of the challenges that I had in the beginning where some of the security institutions were saying we are not and uh, this act, or we exempt. And I had to write to the attorney general to give an opinion, which we then shared with them that, no, you're under the act. But if there's anything specific that you think you cannot share, you invoke the particular exemption, um, you know, based on which you can't make that information available. So I can write to the, the NB, is it NIB? NIB. I can write to National Security Secretary and tell them to give me information, Absolutely. and they are obligated to give it to me. If, if it, it is, is not, not covered. information that is exempt, uh, under the exemptions between sections 5 and 16, then they're obliged to make it available. Why do we need an RTI in a space where we have a government minister for information, government spokespersons on a number of issues, PROs at all ministries, department agencies? Why do we need an RTI system? Okay, so first of all, um, an RTI, that is a right to information, is not new. It was on the 7th of January 1993 that that right was conferred on us. And so, even in spite of all that you have spoken about, that right actually exists. Number two, all that you have mentioned between minister, PRO, uh, et cetera, they honestly don't have the full gamut of um, information available to them. You may be requesting for some specific information that they have to go dig up and make available to you. And, I mean, if you take me as a minister for information, I don't know everything that goes on in government. Mm -hmm. Um, and if you leave it to the discretion of, let's say, the minister or to somebody, that person may deny you that information without cause. 
And that is why it's important to have this piece of legislation and then this administrative structure in place so that if somebody wants information, what's the name of your district? Shai Osudoku. If somebody wants information from the Shai Osudoku district, they want, let's say, a copy of a contract for the school behind Osudoku for whatever purpose, they don't have to come to the minister for information. Even if they speak to the PR of the Shai Osudoku district they assembly have it. and he wants to uh, obfuscate and not make it available, now there's a legal structure that compels the Shai Osudoku the, um, Doku, um, um, district assembly to make a copy of that contract available to him. And it's very important for transparency and for our democracy. Do I have well. to write it under a specific form and mention that I'm writing under our We've made it easy. So when you get to these institutions, we have provided copies of application forms okay. there. And the RTI officers have been trained to assist you, even if you are not lettered, to put in an application that conforms to what the law is looking Does for. Does the law cover private entities? It covers some private entities. And so if you look at the law, it says that if you receive public <clears throat> uh, funds or public resources or you perform public functions, you must um, uh, uh, comply with the act. Indeed, we have a couple of uh, institutions that received requests, refused to make that information available. The um, review applications went to the commission. The commission has determined that they must comply. They have argued that they don't think they must comply, and they've gone to court to challenge it. In fact, today, the lawyers of the commission were in court on one such matter, trying to explain to the court um, why this institution, though it is not a public institution properly so-called, because it receives public resources and performs public functions, must comply uh, with the act. Uh, but, I mean, if you go to the U.S., for example, it took the courts to based on decisions, fully flesh it out for people to get a better understanding. We are just two or three years in the beginning, and we are hopeful that some of these uh, gray areas will be outlined. If clearly. organizations refuse to give this information, what are the penalties? Well, the RTI Commission has the discretion to levy penalties, mm -hmm. and that discretionary power means that they would examine a number of things. I know of instances in which some institutions have been levied as high as 300,000 CDs. Some have been levied as low as 20,000 Ghana cities for various, may I say, breaches uh, of the commission's orders. But now the attorney general has also, by executive instrument, given the RTI commission prosecutorial powers. Okay, what does that mean? That means that the offenses that exist under the act uh, can now actually be prosecuted. And uh, once they are offenses, if you are prosecuted and if the courts convict you, um, you may not go to prison, but there will be some uh, pecuniary, uh, may I say... So for refusing, for refusing to give the information, the commission can... obstructing, yes. The commission can decide to take you to court. Yes. And then prosecute you. Yes. And if you are found guilty, you may make... You have to pay some money. You have to personally. Okay. Yeah. I see. Interesting. What about the application process? Digitization is the way to go. Yeah. Why do you need a single human being in each office across the country when you could just have everything uploaded onto a computer software mm -hmm. where I can just click and download? Well, thankfully, we've done that. We've uh, rolled out what we call the ORMS, the Online Records Management System, which uh, very shortly we will outdoor. What it does is that it allows the um, records officers in the institutions to keep a digital mapping um, uh, template of the records in the institution. There are many institutions in which the records officers sometimes don't even know what information exists in the institution. So first, it allows them to keep that digital map. Two, they are then able to populate what the law calls the information manual. Every public institution must publish an information manual which outlines the kind of information that you have. And it makes it easier for people who are applying or looking for information to know what you have and what you don't have. Then we don't go around in circles. So one, there's a digital map. Two, it helps in, with the information manual. Three, it will do what you are saying, which now allows applicants to just sit behind the computer and make that application. And then four, it also then allows the information officer to um, uh, navigate between the request that has been received and how to fetch that information and inform the applicant that, yes, this is granted. You can pick it up in seven days and pay X or Y or Z uh, you for it. You said that a lot of consumers of this have been journalists, largely. Yes. And it's only fair, too, that I'm receiving questions from colleague journalists who want me to no, ask that's you. fine. So my colleague, Fred Duho, says, who pays for the surcharge that these public offices are going to be surcharged in case they are found guilty by the commission? Who, who, who takes care? Is it the individual who refused to give the information or the institution, which then again means that a taxpayer? No, so there are various categories. If um, you have been prosecuted for an offense, 
the 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 fine by the court will be on you. Okay. You as a person. Individual. Yes. If, for example, you within an organization are obstructing the work, let's say, of the RTI officer or the RTI process. As your personal headache. The burden is on you. Okay. If the institution as an entity is refusing to um, comply, let's say, with the orders of the commission and a penalty, like in the case of, I think I can cite an example, let's say Keta, mm -hmm. Keta Municipal Assembly, got a request, refused to uh, provide the information. The commission got involved, gave an order. Initially, they were being a bit obstinate um, about it. The commission levied a penalty of 20,000 Ghana cities. That is on the commission. I mean, that on is the on the institution, on the assembly, because there, there have been engagements um, and then there have been efforts to get them to comply. And as an entity, they are um, refusing. If the institution seeks to distinguish between a particular person who did the obstruction and the institution, they are free to do so. Okay. To make the argument that we as an institution so have no interest here. It was X, who Y, Z that. person who obstructed. Okay. Then that will come back into the bucket of individuals obstructing the work of okay. the country. I don't know if this will fall under RCA, but my uh, correspondent for Northeast, mm -hmm. uh, Mohamed Aminu says, I should ask you, if the security is not exempt, why is it that these days the police refuse to grant interviews to the media saying that everything goes to the central command? Okay, so that is not about RTI. Okay. That is more or less about public relations functions. Okay. And that is an internal, uh, I think, arrangement within the police service mm -hmm. that all PR requests must go to the central communication mm -hmm. director, um, director mm -hmm. for them to vet and be clear on messaging. That's absolutely nothing to do with RTI. right information. If you want some information, let's say from the Ghana Police Service, you can file an RTI request properly so-called under the Act. And when you file that, it's not at their discretion to give or not to give to you. They are seized by the law to make it available to you if it is not exempt information. And if it is exempt information, they have to provide the legal basis in accordance with the law between Sections 5 and Section 16 why they are refusing to make that information available. And if that... Um, answer doesn't make sense to you or you're not comfortable with it. You have three levels of appeal. First, you appeal to the head of institution, in which case that would be the IGP. Okay. So the application doesn't go to the IGP. It goes to the information officer. The law but says, if there's a failure... If the... there's a failure, the first point of appeal is the head of institution. That's the IGP. Okay. If you are not satisfied with the institution's decision, you can then appeal or send in um, 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 a petition to the RTI commission. Okay. If you are not satisfied with the decision of the commission, you can then go to the courts. So that's a hierarchy. That's a hierarchy. Finally, before we go, you have been at the Information Ministry throughout this government's life. You've seen the RTI become law and you are supervising the setting up and the work so far. Yeah. What do you hope to achieve by next year or two or by 10 years? What do you want to see done with the RTI that we say, oh, we've succeeded? First, let me say it's a major point of joy for me because right from the beginning when I was practicing in the studios where you are sitting. We were yeah. all part of those who are shouting, <laughs> pass the RTI Act now. So I take it as a point of pride when it fell on me to move the final motion in Parliament for it to be passed into law okay. and to be the one leading the implementation. Uh, so far, this is how far we've come. I'm hoping that in the next one year, we would have been able to ramp up, A, the number of institutions that have uh, uh, RTI officers there. We only have 320 there now. Mm -hmm. We need to ramp up to maybe about the full fair set of about 600 institutions because we notice that where we have RTI officers, compliance is top notch. Where we don't, then we have some more gaps. So as a first step, ramping up the numbers so that we can have higher compliance. As a second step, my expectation will be that when RTI is functioning the way it is functioning, what will end up happening is that access to information will be significantly improved and people don't have to resort to ESC and I have heard and I have heard, but they can actually invoke the law and get the information, particularly for academia. I'm sure when you were in school and you're trying to do your dissertation, you may have come across a scenario mm -hmm. where institutions don't want to give information. Don't mind you. Now, by law, it's not at the discretion of um, you know whoever they has ought to give it to you. Have to give. You just have to invoke the law. So information is going to be easy now. Uh, and government, even though it likes hiding things, this particular one, it cannot hide. I'm here before you. How am I hiding things? Oh, governments generally like to hide things. <laughs> don't Thank generalize. You. Don't generalize. Thank you so much, Minister, for, Thank you, for joining us. Uh, that has been the... Well, we, I didn't even get to ask you about first year, but I would love to, but unfortunately... You should invite right. me for a conversation on a Maybe we should go to Achimansa and go and eat for food after that. We can talk about it. <laughs> I hear you. Thank you so much.